by Jim Rickards, a renowned financial analyst, discussing the ongoing banking crisis and its root causes. He sheds light on the chain of events that began with the failure of banks involved in both traditional and crypto finance. The story unfolds from March 2023, when the FDIC took over Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate Bank, exposing the precarious state of the financial sector. What's fascinating is the revelation of a bail-in strategy that emerged from the ashes of the 2008 financial crisis. This strategy has far-reaching implications for depositors, investors, and the entire financial system. So let's explore Jim Rickard's insights into this unfolding crisis and how it may affect the broader economy. Jim Rickards starts by asserting that the banking crisis is far from over. He explains that financial crises don't happen suddenly in one catastrophic event. They tend to emerge gradually, with regulators and investors believing they have the situation under control until it resurfaces. The crisis he discusses traces back to a lesser-known bank, Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank. Jim Rickards highlights the critical link between the crypto world and the traditional banking system. The collapse of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, in late 2021 served as a warning sign. As Bitcoin's value plummeted from $69,000 to around $13,000 in a year, it raised questions about potential contagion from the crypto market to the banking world. Silvergate Bank played a crucial role as a bridge between cryptocurrencies and fiat money. This dual nature exposed the traditional financial system to the volatile crypto market. Jim Rickards shifts the spotlight to the Silicon Valley Bank crisis, emphasizing the FDIC's response. On March 10, 2023, the FDIC declared Silicon Valley Bank insolvent and announced that only deposits up to $250,000 were insured. For deposits exceeding this amount, depositors received a receivership certificate with an uncertain value. Remarkably, it's revealed that only 3% of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were insured, totaling approximately $140 billion. This meant that the majority of depositors were facing significant losses, including big names in Silicon Valley like Roku and Cisco. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. The banking crisis is not over. The crises don't happen all at once in one day. They emerge, regulators deal with them, the other new investors come in, they go, oh, it's all good, we got this under control, and then there's two or three months of a quiet period, and then they just pop back up again. It's because they were never fixed in the first place. A lot of people think this all started with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and that was um, uh, March, uh, March 10th, um, 2023, when the FDIC declared them well, basically took over, put them into receivership. But that's not quite the right starting date. The day before March 9th, there was another failure. It was Silvergate Bank, not Silicon Valley, but Silvergate. Silvergate failed, basically closed its doors and went bankrupt. And they were um, they were an, uh, an FDIC insured bank. They were a member of the Federal Reserve System. So they weren't some kind of weird, you know, uh, semi-bank or shadow bank or whatever you want to call it. They were a real bank. But they had one foot in the mainstream banking world at the Fed, but they had another foot in the crypto world. And they were actually a portal between crypto and dollars. And you could buy and sell crypto and get dollars. They would credit your account and all that. But w when I saw the crypto collapse coming, or not coming, uh, uh, it, it happened, uh, November 2021, Bitcoin was $69,000 by November 2022. Um, it was down to around uh, $13,000, uh, give or take. So that was a 90, you know, 90 plus percent collapse. And I saw that, I said, well, there's no way this is confined to Bitcoin. And I was right. A lot of crypto exchanges uh, failed. But the question I kept asking myself, is there a danger, and there is a danger, that this will, this will, uh, there'll be contagion from the crypto world to the banking world. That was the question I goes crypto it could all go to zero, you know, knock yourself out. But if it goes into the banking world, we got much bigger problems. And it did. And Silvergate was that portal. Okay. Next day, Silicon Valley Bank fails. And the FDIC did a very interesting thing. They did their job. Uh, and by that, I mean, they issued a press release. The press release came out at 6 p.m. on Friday, um, March 10, 2023. And it said, we are insuring all deposits up to $250,000. That's what we do. But if your deposit is more than that, you're uninsured. 
we're going to give you what they call a uh, receivership certificate um and uh hang on to it <laughs> we'll get back to you as in terms of what it's worth uh it's you can't cash it in we don't know what it's worth we will then proceed to sell the assets of the bank uh pay off creditors and if as and when there's anything left over we'll distribute that to you on a pro rata basis but you know just hang on we'll, we'll get back to you in terms of what this is worth well it turns out that of course this was all known just said look at the data silicon valley bank only had three percent insured deposits 97 percent of the deposits were uninsured and the amount was approximately 140 billion dollars and they weren't all like you know two million dollar a round startups you had um roku uh cisco uh you know and other other names you know big silicon valley names that had multi-billion dollar deposits and for that matter um one of the one of the crypto exchanges had a three billion dollar deposit at um silicon valley bank in response to the impending crisis jim rickards highlights how high profile figures including bill ackman and other silicon valley billionaires rushed to the white house warning that the failure of these banks could have catastrophic consequences for the tech sector these banks had extended substantial loans to over 200 startups and companies in silicon valley these businesses had payroll obligations, employees, and a significant role in technology development, making their collapse a potential disaster. Within 48 hours, the situation took a dramatic turn. Jim Rickards reveals that the FDIC's initial stance of only insuring deposits up to $250,000 had been reversed. They decided to guarantee all deposits, including multi-billion dollar ones. This sudden reversal, often referred to as a bail-in, marked a significant policy shift. The FDIC, acting in accordance with their announcement at the 2014 G20 meeting in Brisbane, indicated that depositors and investors would have to bear the responsibility of rescuing the banks before government intervention. Jim Rickards shares a fascinating insight in the White House's decision to step in. Many of the companies being financed by Silicon Valley Bank were in the green technology sector. This alignment with green initiatives played a pivotal role in persuading the government to intervene. While it was commonly assumed that these banks primarily supported tech startups, they had a significant hand in financing green initiatives, particularly in battery technology and wind energy. So it wasn't clear that they weren't going to fail. I mean, this this was contagion and recontagion, if you want to think of it that way. So what happened over the weekend between uh, March 10th and March 12th, all the crybaby billionaires, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys, they all go running to the White House saying, you don't understand what you're doing here. We got you know, 200 startups in, you know, Silicon Valley. They're all, they all got like three, five million. They got payrolls, they got employees, they got rent, they got technology development. You're going to destroy the tech sector if you don't bail this out. Um, and so then on six o'clock Sunday, just 48 hours after the first sound, by the way, I should add that, um, going back to the Friday announcement that actually came out of the Brisbane G 20 meeting in 2014, in 2014, Brisbane G 20, they were, we remember we were still in the aftermath of the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Right. There was an uproar. Citizens were, uh, pardon my language, they were just pissed off. The taxpayers bailed out the banking system and all the billionaires kept their jobs. So Jamie Dimon, he's still collecting bonuses, Goldman Sachs, all of them. None of them failed. They, they would have failed, mm -hmm. but for the fact that they were all bailed out. But the everyday Americans are like, you know, unemployment's 9%. I lost my job. I lost my, my 401ks down 50%, et cetera. So there was a political reaction to that. So in Brisbane in 2014, they came up with the, not the bailout theory, but the bail-in theory. And right. bail-in means that um, if a bank fails, the investors, the, you know, the, the stockholders, the bondholders, the depositors, they have to basically pay off the creditors. They have to pay off the depositors. Um, and only, only when there's nothing left would the government maybe, maybe chip in. So, so what, uh, and put, and they put the world on notice. The, um, the insured amount in Europe is a hundred thousand euros. U.S. is $250,000, but the whole world was on notice. That's all we cover over that. You're on your own. Well, what the FDIC did on Friday was actually consistent with what they all said they were going to do in 2014. It was a bail in. And if you had a billion dollar deposit, you're going to contribute to the rescue. Within 48 hours, they did a 180 degree turn. They completely blew away the $250,000 insurance limit. They said, we're, we're guaranteeing all the deposits, 
multi-billion dollar deposits. By the way, a dirty little secret about what happened at the White House. I said that, you know, the the, the Silicon Valley billionaires were crying about all these little startups and all this stuff. The truth is, a lot of what Silicon Valley Bank was financing was um, green technology. They were a climate bank. And of course, that's all you have to say to the White House. Hey, this is green. And like, oh, yeah. Now, what were they doing? I don't know. Battery technology, uh, better windmills. Uh, none of that stuff works, by the way. But but no. they were <laughs> they were in the White House sweet spot by saying green. And they, they were. That was actually what they were financing. Everyone thinks, oh, somebody's working on an app. They weren't apps. They were, they were like battery power. Jim Rickards then pivots to another significant event that occurred on March 12, 2023, when Signature Bank, not directly related to Silicon Valley Bank, faced a crisis. The bank, where Barney Frank served on the board, was hit hard. Remarkably, Barney Frank was known for his role in co-authoring the Dodd-Frank Act, a comprehensive piece of legislation designed to address the failings of the 2008 financial crisis. The reason for Signature Bank's troubles lay in its investment in government bonds. When interest rates surged, these long-duration bonds lost 80% of their value. It's an excellent example of how bond prices are inversely related to interest rates. As rates went up, bond prices plummeted, leaving the bank underwater and insolvent. To address the widespread issue of banks holding bonds with reduced market values, the Federal Reserve offered an interesting solution. The Fed announced a facility where banks could exchange these bonds, which were worth less than their purchase price for loans matching the face value of the bonds. This meant that banks were putting up collateral worth less than the loan amount they received. So um, Sega bailed out. At the same time on Sunday night, now we're talking uh, March, uh, March 12th, they closed another bank, which was Signature Bank. Something about S, you know, Silvergate, Silicon, Signature, all the S's were going down. Now Signature Bank was another interesting case, which was Barney Frank was on the board of Signature. And if that name rings a bell, just think of Dodd Frank. Dodd Frank, 2010, thousand page legislation. I know uh, I met I met Barney, I know Chris Dodd very well. Um, that was supposed to solve all the problems of the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, et cetera. Here, the author of the bailout legislation is on the board of the bank and his bank gets shut down. Well, I, what's up with that? Uh, well, the, they had, um, they bought government bonds, uh, and when interest rates went up from you know ten-year note, uh, treasury note yield to maturity went from like you know one and three quarters to like four, all those bonds lost eighty percent of the value. That's what happens on long-duration bonds. You know, bond math is simple: rates up, price down, vice versa. While well, the rates were up, the price was down. So they were underwater um, and insolvent, and they got shut down. So Barney Frank's out whining the next day. He's like, "Hey, yeah." But that's true of every bank in the country. There's not a bank out there that didn't load up on treasury bonds at one and three quarters. They're all underwater. They're all insolvent. Yeah. And by the way, the Fed announced a facility. You know, they always have these four initials. I forget when this one was, a like <laughs> or whatever. But, um, but basically what they said was, if you're a member bank and you have treasury securities that are where the mark to market value is below par. So you paid 10 million, but they're only worth 8 million. And that was... Mm the case across the board. So I get oh, trillion, wow. trillion dollars or more of bonds that are in that category. You can deliver them to us and we will lend you for one year the face value. So you're putting up 80 cents of collateral, but you're getting a hundred cent loan. I said, I got a 15 year old car. Will you lend me the what I paid for it? Because it's a lot more than it's worth now. Um, <laughs> but that's what they did. So now I'm now my head's spinning. I'm like, well, I, mean, I get all this stuff. But I'm like, oh, so you just guaranteed every deposit in the banking system without limit and you just guaranteed every treasury bond at par value without limit yeah what's left like what else do you have in your bag of tricks because you don't have it there's nothing else you can do go back to 2008 they guaranteed every money market fund in the country so uh but here's barney frank whining hey yeah. yeah my bank was in trouble but so was every bank in the country why did you whack me and give all these guys a pass well the answer is Signature Bank was another crypto bank. It had a portal called Signet, and Signet was a way, was a portal to the crypto world. And that's why they whacked it. Notice they whacked two crypto banks.
supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread, you know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store, like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. I was like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrapper or a paper wrapper? Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Where the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer. Where the driver come from? Somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know, that, well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh, well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know, where did that come from? And then you find out that the ovens are you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and, and everything else. And really what's called the extended supply chain. And you're like, wait a second, that's a huge number of countries, a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy, which it is. And then every link in that supply chain I described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth. And then that's for a loaf of bread. Well, what about your car, your furniture, your clothes, and, and, and on and on and on. Once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, yeah, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft. They need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? It can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, Beijing, a city of 22 million people, they were both locked down entirely last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? Why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections, a new model. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down US-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period, 
between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics, China kind of re-enters the game, and all this, this was this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to, to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. And it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30 year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things, a lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do to strike back? Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them and China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, etc. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the U.S. to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts. They want five year contracts or at least three year contracts. And they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil, but this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the U.S. farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans. We can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date for the 30 year period of supply chain 1.0. Now we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy in between inefficient muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form. Uh, if you look at yield curves, look at the treasury yield curve, Euro dollar futures yield curve, German buns yield curve, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, 
the um yeah, whatever your baseline is probably treasuries you know to your notes or five year notes or whatever they will come down a lot not right away it's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this but they'll come down a lot and then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession because of deterioration increased bankruptcies reduced revenues you know etc so those spreads will blow out and it's important to remember um interest rates are a lagging indicator everyone's like well how could interest rates be um going up if we're in a recession the answer is as you get closer to recession who figures it out first well the fed figures it out last they're usually the last to know wall street is second last to know the people who figure it out first are actual business people entrepreneurs restaurant owners dry cleaners taxi drivers um or even medium-sized businesses they see it uh, you know if you're in the trucking business it's it's real time uh you know if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed you're not moving anything by truck so there are certain businesses that are concurrent the yield curves i was talking about are very good forward indicators they tell you what's going to happen next a lot of business people are living in the real world in real time they know what's happening now and the stock market tends to figure it out later but as far as banking and credit is concerned what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down you know fewer customers whatever you go out and borrow all you can you're like hey there's a really bad recession coming i better if i got lines of credit i'm going to use them up now i don't want my bank changing the terms i said i'm going to borrow everything i can and that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up and then the recession hits and the bankers go huh what's going on credit losses start going up and then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards they stop doing loans and then interest rates will start to come down interest rates peak after the recession has already begun so interest rates may not have peaked yet i mean you know even the treasury market so that's not unusual now here's what the fed is uh is missing or maybe everybody's missing when you hear these layoff announcements people are like well if they're laying off why isn't why isn't the unemployment rate going up well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs there's all kinds of statute you know sec so if i'm going to fire 10,000 people i got to tell the world i'm firing 10,000 people it doesn't mean i fire them that day i might fire them you know on a rolling basis over the next 30 days and it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty-handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag, three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle, and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not, if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, 1% a day, trending down lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession 
Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates and then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, the stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is going to play out and it'll get worse as the year goes on. The inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up, all right. Let's talk about it. but that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. This is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession. They're raising rates and inflation is coming down. But what they don't know is our interest rates coming down because they're raising rates or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it. And that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening, which they are, they are going to over tighten, probably already have it. The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So we shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from forty dollars to one hundred twenty dollars in in under a year. 
The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, there's a natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I say, I lived through the seventies. Um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want? Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone. Sooner than later, pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates. Inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask, they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and, and I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects between 77 and 81. So that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not gonna spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That, requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, etc. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and in inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd, uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer of electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another 
fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Global economy is, is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they, oh, crash, you know, correct down. So there's a little bit of that going on. But in terms of the global economy, um, I think your use of the word global is very, much on point because we are going into or may already be in a global recession. Now that's rare. It's it's rare when hey, China, Japan, U.S., Germany, they're all in recession at the same time. But that's what's unfolding. That's a big deal. Uh, well, for obvious reasons, uh, because uh, you know it affects uh, basically everyone. But um, there's no life preserver. There's no. You know, it's not like China's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports, or or Japan's going to you know put the pedal to the metal in terms of fixed. Uh, asset investment, uh, you know, et cetera. So, so that's a really bad sign. I mean, and just to be very specific, you know, we just saw U.S. fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9% annualized rate. People are like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, it's not good by post-1980 standards. It's not good at all by post-World War II standards. But post-2008, yeah, that's not, that's not bad. Uh, again, you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew. It was uh, inventories were a big contributor uh, and net exports were a big contributor. Um, and a fi fixed asset investment in particular, there was a big load of um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. And this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. That's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, let's say, the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID. We're, we're, we're going to start growing. Uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one, you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this, at the, at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do or wholesalers for that matter? But retail, they slash prices that, you know, two for one sales, uh, you know, because Inventories are a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them. So they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know, you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like style, uh, fashion goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, ne last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's, it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff. Um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13. Well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up. Demand destruction is kicking in. Costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023 Possibly recession started in December. If not, we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. 
Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But, um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and, and oil prices skyrocketed um, again in mid-2022. Uh, they've come down, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all is well or, or they're out of the woods. And there are, there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, you know, they went from zero COVID. It was bad public policy and bad health policy. But they did it anyway. So they flipped almost on a dime. So they just turned on a dime and said, okay, let it rip. The, the policy, let it rip. Okay, let everyone get infected and we'll do the best we can. One of the ways you get through it is by letting rip and you develop what's called herd immunity. And that's what worked in North America and Europe. But the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, the treatments, uh, the, just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors, not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they, uh, they often have nothing, but that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful, but, uh, but you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top-down management where you can't possibly get everything right, you know, and so and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off, um, you know, high-tech exports to China, including their country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. On the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality. What's actually happening? Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then, uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm a storyteller here, but, um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They probably are at the um, so-called terminal rate. They just don't know it. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. Um, and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but, you know, rate cut in August, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out. But for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up, as usual, as they've been doing since 1913, they over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened. On uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about this. It was on the short list. To be nominated to the Board of Governors in Washington to fill the seat that Lael Brainerd left. Lael Brainerd was a um, member of the Board of Governors. I believe she was vice chairman. Uh, but she left to go to the White House uh, in the National Economic Council. She, but she, she really is smart. She's, she's a big brain. Like she, she knows what she's talking about. Very few of them do, but she's one of them. But she goes to the White House, but that's an audition 
for Secretary of the Treasury because they're going to throw Yellen under the bus. Yellen knows nothing. If Yellen were on this call right now, she wouldn't know anything we're talking about. How is that she, possible, Jim? Affirmative action. She's a, uh, she's a, uh, when she was chairman of the Fed, I said she was incompetent and I was right. And then she became Secretary of the Treasury. She, she's a, She's a statistics geek from Berkeley. She uh, she's got a big brain. I'll give her credit on IQ points. So what? That's not the same as common sense or or working knowledge or knowing how the street works. She's never worked you know outside of government in her entire life. I don't care what your resume is. If you've never run a business, met a payroll, um, you know, negotiated a purchase sale agreement, um, you know, had kept your morale up with negative cash flow. If you've never done any of those things, um, you don't know what it's like to be in the, in the real world of the economy. She doesn't, but she, but her specialty as an economist was, was labor economics. Okay. Well, there's a place for that, but not, not as U.S. Tre treasury secretary. You have to know, mon she didn't know monetary policy of the Fed. She doesn't know fiscal policy of the treasury. There's no nothing about international economics. And that gets us into the, the role of the dollar. She's just, she was like, uh, her husband won a Nobel prize. Okay. George Akerlof. I know a lot of her close associates. Um, she, you know, if you don't want to say affirmative action, you can say the Peter principle. Uh, which, you know, this goes back to the 60s, but the Peter principle is you, you get in a bureaucracy and you do a good job and they give you a promotion. And then you keep doing a good job and they give you another promotion and you keep doing a good job. And eventually you get to promote it to something where you're incompetent. You're actually, you're in over your head and you fail, but then you stay there because because you're not getting another promotion um and so the result is bureaucracies are populated with incompetent people because they've all risen to their level of incompetence and have nowhere else to go i would say she got there the fed how she got another chance at treasury but that's you know that that's the answer um and uh but but leo brainerd i'll say is uh is more talented and hopefully she'll be so they'll throw you all under the bus blame her that's by the way that's the biden technique deflection and and denial and uh just blaming other people so they'll blame her for the whole thing she probably doesn't see that coming by the way maybe she should tune into london real and then uh, then they'll put little brainerd over there but mary daly was on the short list to fill brainerd's seat at the fed well you can forget that she can't get the we're hearing at this point but she was um running around on you know climate change uh social justice uh george floyd blm and again free country you want to express if you be my guest but not as chief regulator of silicon valley bank yeah yeah it's uh so should they have let it fail and what would have been the carnage jim if they had well again this is hindsight you, you shouldn't have been allowed to get to that place anyway but there might have been more this is where there's a lack of creativity it's kind of all or nothing say like, oh if this fails we're going to have a bunch we're going to have a wave of failures of startups in silicon valley well, that's probably true probably true um but most of them fail anyway <laughs> if you know the venture capital business and i'm sure you do uh most of these things fail anyway a couple of winners here and there well if how difficult would it have been so now you're the entrepreneur you had a five yeah five million dollars of working capital which you got in a, a round you know an angel round or whatever from some venture capitalists in silicon valley you got some premises you got a payroll you got some developers you got employees all that stuff and now your cash is frozen not just frozen but gone you got a like a yang money you know you got a do bill from the fdic um if those now who's to say if those companies were well run and they actually had some good technology how difficult would it have been to make a few phone calls and say you know what we're stuck in this thing um i need a i need a two-year bridge loan or i need a one-year bridge loan uh and uh, i'll collateralize it by the proceeds of my receivership certificate and as and when i get paid i'll pay down the loan we can have a simultaneous closing all good you you could have got money the, those some of those friends could have got money some of them not um maybe some layoffs uh maybe they would have failed and but most of them do anyway i mean that's my first point but that was not the majority of and you know unemployment would have gone up i mean i'm not saying that there are no hardships brian but but we gloss over the greater hardships on the economy as a whole and that gets to the other lie which was janet yellen coming out and saying um there's no cost to the taxpayer like wait a second because <laughs> you, you mentioned the bailout of the fed taking the loans below market value and giving them you know uh, uh, yeah uh, sorry at market value and giving them par value which is more for one year and 
glossed over that whole thing. Um, but there was a separate bailout, which is the FDIC guaranteed every penny of every deposit in all those banks. Well, when you look at the numbers, you have grossly uh, depleted the insurance fund. The FDIC is an insurance company. It's, that's what the I stands for. Uh, <laughs> and um, they have reserves, just like every other insurance company. They charge premiums. That's how they go. Uh, this would have basically wiped out the reserves. So how are you going to top up the reserves in the FDIC for future bank failures? Well, they said, we're going to raise premiums on the banks. Okay, they are. But uh, what do the banks do? Well, they're going to either pay you less interest or charge you fees. In other words, that, the bank isn't just going to sit there and write checks to the FDIC and, and watch their P&L evaporate. They're going to pass the cost on to the customer, which is us, which is the American people. So is, does your tax bill go up? No, but your interest rate's gone down or your banking fees are going up. So the cost is shifted to everyday Americans. So don't tell me that we're not paying the bill because we are. So again, these are these are in the, the nature of government lies to kind of you know disguise what they're actually doing i uh well i don't have a hundred billion dollars so maybe there maybe there's a level where you got enough money and it's not your primary concern um it, it, you know i like making money but it's not what the first thing i think about when i wake up in the morning the first thing i think about is how do you you know solve problems and what's going on um and you know it must seems to have some of that maybe more than a little uh you know look if you don't have free speech and you abandon the constitution i mean is this is this like the uh the fall of the roman republic i mean it, it, there's a little bit of a um uncomfortable resemblance uh, again going back to what we said earlier you gotta you gotta study history it's not it's it's certainly not the same but there's no better playbook for doing analysis and a really good understanding of history it's why um today in america and i would say uh not just communists but neo-fascists and other forms of dictators and we have plenty of those in washington the one of the first things they kill in the curriculum is history they stop teaching it because if you knew a lot of history you'd see you'd see these things for what they are um but um but i i have some pretty good history teachers and i've always been interested in it so uh yeah i was um i was shocked by what's revealed even though i've been around enough to maybe maybe not be shocked but but just the extent of it and and the depth of it and uh i um have a lot of sympathy for the uh, users who were suppressed and squashed and deplatformed and even more sympathy for the victims of that kind of censorship. So we were on the front lines of that information war in 2020. And so when I see these files, I see it from a slightly different angle. I mean, April 6, 2020, we had the second largest YouTube live stream in the world that day, Jim. 65,000 wow. concurrent viewers watch me in this studio uh, have a two and a half hour conversation where things were questioned as far as efficacy of a PCR test, masks, future vaccination policies, which were really early. Even origination of the virus might have come out of Wuhan, something they literally almost lock you up if you had mentioned that in April right. of 2020. 30 minutes after that, Jim, for the first time in my nine year history of London Real, a video of mine on YouTube was deleted and banned. And right. I thought, what is going on here? I thought the weirdos are the people that got censored in this world. And then after that, I was subsequently banned, shadow banned from the following platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Dropbox, PayPal, right? With yep. Six figures of balances on PayPal. Dropbox, where I didn't think they were watching my videos. I mean, that's technically right. my information. And Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I leave that to the guests on my show that come on because I think they have the right for free speech and we should all listen to what they have to say. But when I saw those Twitter files for the first time, Jim, I thought, okay, if there was a coordinated effort, it would have to come from a single source and why not come from someone who was trying to say, please, can we stop people talking about X? So I saw right. it in a slightly different state to where I was like, oh, okay, now I could see maybe how that coordination could happen. Um, yeah, and I like, I like the way you put it, Brian. You said with with this guest, this particular show, you were questioning things. You weren't being categorical about this. Uh, you say, well, maybe it did come from Han. And it was that's what you're supposed to do. Um, my my book, the um, the New Great Depression, came out in January 2021. Uh, interestingly, the publication date was supply, was delayed because of the supply chain, which was my next book. But um, I had it pretty much done by the summer 2020. And what strikes me was. The evidence was there then. Now, two years later, 
you know, you're watching uh, whatever Tucker Carlson or, you know, Alex Berenson or others. I'm sure there are many in the UK and they're saying, well, you know, did you, do you know that the masks don't work and the lockdowns don't work? And this thing looks like it came from Wuhan. I was like, yeah, I do. And I said that in 2020, but the point is the evidence was there. It wasn't guesswork. I'll give you a real, real quick example. Um, the leading epidemiologist for virologists of the 20th century, maybe all time is Dr. D.A. Henderson. Now, Thea Henderson is not a household name, but if there's a single individual most responsible for eradicating smallpox on the planet Earth, it was D.A. Henderson. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is our highest civilian honor, equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor in the military, um, dean of the uh, Bloomberg Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I mean, you know, you, you can't go any higher in the profession, have more respect than D.A. Henderson. He wrote a paper in 2005 that said lockdowns don't work. Um, and he had the research to back it up. This was at the time, I believe it was the swine flu was going on. There was an avian flu and a swine flu during the Bush administration. Bush was actually very concerned about it. And Henderson wrote those papers that they don't work. Uh, and I cited that in my book. But the point is, we didn't have to wait until 2021 or 2022, in China's case, you know, today, to find out that lockdowns don't work. In 2020, we had a paper from 2005 that said the same thing. He said, if you have an island and there's no airstrip and only one way in or out, and you got a hundred people, maybe, but that's not North America, that's not Europe, that's not the world, they just don't work. Um, well, if we knew that from the leading epidemiologist, maybe of all time, uh, why didn't we follow that advice? Well, the answer was it was a hidden agenda. They they wanted to shut they wanted to shut people down. They wanted to um, uh, basically the, the the inner we empowered the inner fascists uh, in in all these government bureaucrats. Uh, I mean, it was it, it was Black Charles, it was Fisher Black, Myron Charles, but there was a third contributor. and He won the Nobel Prize, which was uh, Robert C. Merton. Merton, yeah. Uh, Merton was at Harvard, and 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 Fisher and Myron had worked on this for a long time and had come close, but weren't all the way there. They went to Merton to help with the math, actually. And Merton solved the math problem for them, but to his credit, a very generous, another really, really nice guy, uh, he said, look, you guys go ahead and publish this, and then I'll I'll tag along a few months later with my contribution. And the, the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So Fisher Black sadly died before they got the prize. So Merton and um and Scholes won the prize and again to their credit they pulled the award divided by three and gave one third to Fisher's widow which I thought was very you know appropriate and um uh you know very uh very uh, generous of them but uh yeah it was a math problem you write about what they call Brownian in motion which is random and you know so it was sort of you had a a fan if you will of probabilities um and then you know different um different degree distributions some more likely than others etc having said that um and you know the success of myron used to say you know jim if, if only i had patented the idea <laughs> and had like a fraction of a penny on all the notion of value i'd be the richest man in the world which is probably true yeah. um yeah. but they didn't they they put it in an academic uh, journal but um uh there are there are assumptions in black shoals which you can question i'm not ding in the model science is always hey let's make it better it doesn't mean you don't use what you have um but uh they assume a risk-free rate well is there really anything like is there a risk-free rate is the united states risk-free i i don't think so actually and it's getting riskier by the day so you can kind of question that assumption um does the the future resemble the past with some probability, some degree of distribution of probability, not always. I mean, and maybe less frequently now than ever. And they also assume that prices move continuously. You know, prices go up and down, of course, but that you could get, if it were going up, you could get out of certain levels. If it were going down, you could put stop losses on your position and get out of certain levels. You could manage it. And of course, that was a big contributor to the uh, 1987, uh, October 19th, 1987 flash crash when the market fell 22% in one day. I mean, today we get worked up if it's down 22% in a year, which it was last year uh, approximately, but this is 22% in one day. But uh, it turns out none of that's true. Um, markets don't move continuously, or if they do, it's when you don't care. When you do care, they just gap. They gap, gap down or they gap up. You miss it, you blink, and it's at a completely different level. It's been repriced. Now you can still get in and out, but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money, you know, in the blink of an eye. So, 
when you take those characteristics, and this is how I started kind of you know, deconstructing it, if you will, and said, well, look, markets are not efficient. That's nonsense. They don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free, so why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied um, in long-term capital, but really everywhere, um, and you say, well, what, what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system. You know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just, you know, it just, <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. Um, and that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course, it, it, it is. So a very good point, Brian. So let's go back to um, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis broadly defined in the early 1980s. Th that played out, at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long-term capital management. That uh, was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September, 1998. SVB was three days. Or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but. We didn't know because, you know, you get to close business Thursday. We didn't know until Sunday that the money was going to move. We got a confirmation on Monday. We didn't end up moving the money. But there was this about a 48 hour period there from Friday to Sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed. The recipients didn't have them. It was just in limbo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it worked out. Um, one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, forget the name of, well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. I mean, there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank. It wasn't all, uh, all a bunch of little guys. So, um, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, in the old days, you have the lineup around the, the block and maybe it was raining. You're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower. Now you can be in line at McDonald's, you know, with your cell phone and just a couple of hits, QR code and boom, uh, you know, $10 million is, is gone. And what Peter Thiel did, uh, and it was right. I mean, I'm not criticizing him. He got his own money up, but he, he sent out like an SOS to Silicon Valley. He said, all of you, whoever you are, get your money out now. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of people did, and that was that $40 billion. So, so the time, the time frame is becoming more, more compressed because of technology. You're exactly right about that, which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a, you know, an honest to goodness global financial crisis. So, and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence, but on Friday night, March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over. Uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured. No, no worries. You'll have your money Monday morning and over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen. They didn't say suspended. They said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time They we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. 
Well, that's when the, that's when I called the uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys. Oh, you got to save us! You know, and I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now, here here's something that very few people say. Almost nobody knew at the time, except the management. Although they seem to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yes, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. Ninety seven percent of the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. And by the way, that's my new metric for assessing banks. You used to look at, you know, working capital and debt equity ratios and, you know, bad, bad assets, governments. There are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank. But the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured, which meant all the money was going to run and it did. So that's the way if you're looking at these big banks or, uh, um, you know, any, any institution or your own savings institution to, to look at it. But, um, but Silicon Valley Bank was a climate bank. Were they investing in startups? Yes. Were they investing in technology? Yes. But these were climate. These were green new scam, uh, uh, startups looking at, you know, battery technology, uh, you know, the chemi chemistry physics, you know, to try to make a better battery, but not much improvement in the battery in, in 200 years, but, uh, there's, they're working on it. Um, you know, wind turbines, uh, you know, other sustainable fuel alternatives, et cetera. Again, I'm not do that if you like, if that's your field of research, but so much is subsidized by the government. And then further subsidized by Silicon Valley Bank. And that's where the, that's where the assets were. That's where the loans were by and large. And so the White House is getting hammered, not only because of entrepreneurs, job losses. And by the way, we are in an election cycle here in the United States, yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful. So within, so that was Friday night. So Saturday, everyone's crying to the White House. Sunday night at six o'clock. By the way, mark that on your calendar. Sunday, at 6 p.m. is when they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they, you know, uh, 6 p.m. Sunday, November 12th, they came out on, uh, sorry, March 12th, they came out on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. The following week, 19th, that was Credit Suisse. Hey, Brian, so let's go back to um, uh, either Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis, broadly defined in the early 1980s. Th that played out, at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long-term capital management. That uh, was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September 1998. SBB was three days. Or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but. We didn't know because, you know, you get to close business Thursday. We didn't know until Sunday that the money was going to move. We got a confirmation on Monday. We didn't end up moving the money. But there was this about a 48 hour period there from Friday to Sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed. The recipients didn't have them. It was just in limbo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it worked out. Um, one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, uh, forget the name of, well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million of working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. I mean, there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank. It wasn't all, uh, all a bunch of little guys. So, um, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, in the old days, you have to line up around the, the block and maybe it was raining. You're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower. Now you can be in line at McDonald's, you know, with your cell phone and just a couple of hits, QR code and boom, uh, you know, $10 million is, is gone. And what Peter Thiel did, uh, and it was right. I mean, I'm not criticizing him. He got his own money up, but he, he sent out like an SOS to Silicon Valley. He said, all of you, whoever you are, get your money out now. 
uh, and a lot of, a lot of people did, and that was that forty billion dollars. So, so the time the time frame is becoming more more compressed because of technology. You're exactly right about that, which means that the response function has to be equally compressed, or else you are going to have all the consequences of a you know an honest to goodness global financial crisis. So, and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence, but on Friday night. March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over, uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured, no, no worries, you'll have your money Monday morning. At over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen, they didn't say suspended, they said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time They we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. Well, that's when the, that's when I call the uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys. Oh, you got to save us! You know, and I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now, here here's something that very few people say. Almost nobody knew at the time, except the management. Although they seemed to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yes, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. Ninety seven percent of the deposits of silicon valley bank were uninsured and by the way that's my new metric for assessing banks you used to look at you know working capital and debt equity ratios and you know bad bad assets governments there are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank but the most relevant way right now is and this is publicly available take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I guess, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured, which meant all the money was going to run and it did. So that's the way, if you're looking at these big banks or, uh, um, you know, any, any institution or your own savings institution to, to look at it. But, um, but Silicon Valley Bank was a climate bank. Were they investing in startups? Yes. Were they investing in technology? Yes. But these were climate. These were green new scam uh, uh, startups looking at, you know, battery technology, uh, you know, the chemi chemistry, physics, you know, to try to make a better battery. But not much improvement in the battery in, in 200 years, but uh, they're, they're working on it. Um, you know, wind turbines. Uh, you know, other sustainable fuel alternatives, etc. Again, I'm not do that if you like, if that's your field of research, but so much is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by Silicon Valley Bank. And that's where the that's where the assets were. That's where the loans were by and large. And so the White House is getting hammered, not only because of entrepreneurs, job losses. And by the way, we are in an election cycle here in the United States, yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful. So within, so that was Friday night. So Saturday, everyone's crying to the White House. Sunday night at six o'clock. By the way, mark that on your calendar. Sunday six p.m. is when they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they, you know, uh, six p.m. Sunday, November twelfth. They came out on uh, sorry, March twelfth. They came out on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. The following week, nineteenth, that was Credit Suisse. The math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear that's not much debate about that the problem is people don't understand what diversification means they think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors semiconductors consumer non durables or whatever they're diversified and what i say to them is you may have 50 stocks but that's one asset class you're in stocks and in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, 
mining companies, uh, and not just gold, gold, yeah, but um, I recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I, I, the Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Uh, and it's a scam, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs, whether it's, whether you like it or not. The fact is, uh, it's going to go on. So the lithium's in short supply, uh, graphite, you know, et cetera. So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented, that will do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slugger cash, absolutely, maybe as much as 30%. I like treasury notes, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, recession and interest rates will follow or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the US treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. and and. You know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious, does, do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a, I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO1. DBO1 is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the price of the bond goes up. They're just, invert. it's a little counterintuitive, but the question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're gonna have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher you know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. The lower the rate, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. That's the basically. So yeah, when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Gold, I always recommend ten percent slice. But based on what we were talking about, I would get silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, you know, the monster box. That's uh, you know bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, it's treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it. You know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are five hundred one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. They'll feed your family for probably a year. Yeah, it's a market price, be around ten, twelve thousand uh, dollars for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlight. I like them both, and you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money, and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist. But I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, there's no, there's not going to be a world of three thousand dollar gold and twenty dollar silver that world doesn't exist if gold is at three thousand silver is going to be pushing a hundred so without giving an exact forecast uh silver will be along for the ride silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications gold really doesn't gold's not good for anything except money but it's the best form of money silver can be, is used in a lot of applications so if you have a recession it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the eight gram coin, I mentioned the quarter ounce American Gold Eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Home prices are coming down a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a place like, you know, uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond, you know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland. Uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. I, I like private equity and it's, you know, you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But, you know, some good deals in the mining sector um, I like. Uh, well, that, 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 that would be one. I, mean I want to just talk to you real quickly about the current state of media. I, I just love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I know this is something that you care about, that you've written about a bit. Um, and... Uh, and you're playing a role in trying to give people, you know, more accurate, more nutritious, more actionable information than, than what they're able to get from the new sources that they're just directed to by society. Um, if you talk about 
what they call legacy media, mainstream media. So Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is I know a lot of these people. I've been on all these programs. I've done this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington. I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine. Some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright or, I mean, they're good on camera they need, uh, or whatever. They got a desk at the Washington Post. They're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now. Uh, I mean, a lot of these people are, 28, 33, 34 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, good. You're, you're in the heart of your career. But that means they graduated from school in, uh, you know, 2016, 2017 or whatever. Um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we, learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the they graded, you needed a C plus average to graduate but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you, how do you even get a C plus if they're writing on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in other words, you were, you were trying to struggle to be, I did get an A in partnership taxation. And I'm proud of that. But my, the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at, you know, Ivy League, whatever, it's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, if revenues are down, advertising's down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down, eventually they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And, you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with, and I'm talking about, you know, military officers, you know, colonels, you know, brigadier generals, um, people on the ground in Ukraine, not, you know, some studio in New York, you can find out what's going on. But I think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to dig.